Well, today marks the end of our study in the book of Romans. Please be turned your Bibles open to the book of Romans. The title of chapter 16 has to be the impossible dream. Remember, the theme of the book of Romans is found at the very beginning. We are reminded that Paul wrote the book of Romans very uniquely in that most of his epistles, his letters were written to address situations in individual churches. And though this book is certainly written to the church at Rome, it was written as the treatise of the Christian faith. It outlines all the great themes of Christianity. And if one were to grasp the foundational teachings of this book, one would surely be marked for maturity in Christ. In Romans 1, in verse 16, we find the theme of the book of Romans, where Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. First for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed. A righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as this is written, the righteous will live by faith. And that is our challenge as disciples, is to live by faith. That's what it means to be righteous. Now, it is interesting Romans was written in about 58 A.D., so about 25 years after the church began. And I think it hits a lot of the people that had been in the kingdom for many years. People that had gotten sentimental about the teachings of God's word and needed to be reminded of the eternal truths of God. And so today, as we study out chapter 16, I've outlined it. To be broken down into three sections. First of all. Is the salutations of appreciation. Verses 1 through 16. And 21 through 24. The second section is. The denunciation of division. Verses 17 through 20. And thirdly. The evangelization of all nations. Verses 25 through 27. Let's get into the text. Chapter 16, beginning in verse 1. Paul says, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church at Centria. I ask you to receive her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints and to give her any help she may need from you. For she has been a great help to many people, including me. You know, we're reminded that Phoebe is the carrier of the letter to Rome from Paul. She was in the church there at Centria. Now, Centria is the seaport of Corinth. It's located just southeast of Corinth. And that was the church that she was in. And so Paul commends her to the church. And he says, listen, this is an awesome sister. Listen, give her any help she may need, for she's been a great help to many people. You know, one of the things that I think as a church we need to always be reminded of is to be a hospitable church to disciples that visit us. Amen. Amen. And I don't know about you, but I get all excited when we have people visiting from St. Louis or visiting from L.A. or visiting from Colorado or visiting from Las Vegas. I mean, it just is encouraging to be with brothers and sisters from different places, is it not? And in a special way, we have two big challenges coming up as a congregation. First of all is the Jubilee on June 18th, 19th, and 20th. As a congregation, we have got to open wide our arms, our hearts, and our houses to welcome these brothers and sisters to be with us. Because it's going to be an incredible spiritual feast. And yet, really, the impact many times of the seminar is just being with other disciples. Because when you're with zealous disciples, I mean, there's just something contagious about zeal. Are you with me right here, church? Secondly, we have the Northern Lights Soccer Tournament in July. And, of course, now now some of the soccer brothers are very excited, particularly about Alfredo moving here. Because he plays soccer. Amen, church? And once more... 
these teams that are coming throughout the Northwest and, and, and some from Canada, we have got to open up our homes and make these brothers and sisters feel at home. Amen. Amen. So just as Paul admonished the church at Rome, hey, give Phoebe all the help she needs. I mean, she's helped so many people. So I want to encourage you for the Jubilee, for the soccer tournament. Let's really give to everybody that's coming to Portland. Amen, church. Now, look at the next verse that follows right here. In verse three, Paul says, greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus. Drop on down. Verse five. Greet also the church that meets in their house. Greet my dear friend and Panitas. Verse six. Greet Mary. Verse seven. Greet Andronicus and Junius. And he goes all the way through here. And it's very interesting. The New International Version does use the word greet. And I don't know about you, but when I hear greet, I kind of go, well, that's like someone saying, hey, how you doing? (laughs) But I don't think it really carries what Paul was trying to convey when he was writing very specific encouragement to these disciples that were already in Rome. Now, remember, Paul had never been to Rome. That's the incredible thing right here. But look how many people he knows. But what he's saying, it's not greet like going, hey, uh, Andronicus, uh, hey, Mary, what's up? You know, that's not what he's saying. The King James Version perhaps puts it the best. Instead of the word greet, it uses the word salute. Salute Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus. They risked their lives for me, not only I. But all the churches of the Gentiles are grateful to them. Salute also the church that meets in their house. Salute my dear friend Impenitus, who is the first convert to Christ in the province of Asia. Salute Mary, who worked very hard for you. Salute Andronicus and Junius, my relatives who've been in prison with me. Do you get the connotation of Paul's heart right here, guys? Verse 8. Greet Ampolinus, whom I love in the Lord. Salute Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and my dear friend Stachus. Salute Urbanus. Salute our fellow worker in Christ. You see right here, what he's getting in, he's saying, listen, we are bonded because of the mission. Do you see that all the way through in the scriptures right here? Verse 10. Greet Apelles, tested and approved in Christ. Greet those who belong to the household of Aristobulus. Greet Herodian, my relative. Greet those in the household of Narcissus who are in the Lord. Greet Tryphena and Tryphosa, those women who work hard in the Lord. Greet my dear friend Perseus, another woman who has worked very hard in the Lord. Now, let's stop right there. You know, there's no doubt that Priscilla and Aquila were special friends of Paul. And it's kind of interesting as we go deeper into Scripture. And I think as you mature in Christ, you've got to start digging into the Word of God. Are you with me right here? And one of the things that builds faith is to figure out how all the books and all the brothers and sisters mentioned in those books are interconnected. And then it starts to all make sense. And it builds your faith of what you've got to be for Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Now, Priscilla and Aquila meet Paul in Acts chapter 18. In what some people think is a happenstance. Something that happened just by chance. Say, well, what what do you mean? Well, Paul was evangelizing Greece in that particular time, so he's going into Corinth. But just by chance. But in the church, we don't believe in chance. We believe in God. Amen, church? The Bible says that Claudius in Rome kicked out all the Jews in Rome. And some of those Jews were Priscilla and Aquila, and they landed there in Corinth. Well, we know that Priscilla and Aquila were disciples by the time they get to Corinth. So, what's going on here? Very interestingly, in secular history, one of the most famous historians of the first century is a man named Josephus. Josephus records that Claudius, the emperor, did indeed kick out all the Jews from Rome. Say, what was going on? Well, Josephus details it. He says, there was such a controversy amongst the Jews over a man named Christus. That he said, man, get these Jewish people. They're fighting each other. Get them out of the city. Now, of course, we understand from our study of Scripture that the conversion of disciples always first occurred amongst the Jews. And for a person to become 
a Christian from a Jewish background was a very radical decision. As a matter of fact, right here it became so radical and there were so many that there was such an uproar that Claudius couldn't separate Jews from Jewish Christians. He says, listen, there's such an uproar over this guy, Christus, everybody out of the city. And you say, oh, but wasn't Rome the most influential city in the world? And and wasn't that really hard then with all these disciples leaving? Yes, that's true. But remember, God is sovereign. Everything that happens, he either makes happen or he allows happen. And he's got a greater purpose than we may understand. And so it was by God that Aquila and Priscilla land up in Corinth with Paul. And by chance, Paul's run out of money. So he falls back on tent making. They're tent makers. Guess how they come together? They start making tents, but they're preaching the word. Of course, Paul gets fired up when Timothy comes with some money so we can go back preaching full time. Amen. Amen. But they come together. Then, then they go with Paul, Priscilla and Aquila accompany Paul to Ephesus. Paul then says, listen, I've got to leave you here in Ephesus. I've got to go to Syria. So Priscilla and Aquila are left there, and that's when they convert Apollos, one of the most gifted orators of the young church. And you know, that says to me, Priscilla and Aquila were awesome. They backed up Paul in a great way. You know what I mean? Not everybody is an upfront type leader. We need some people that can really... Back up, people. You you see what I'm talking about right here? We all need to find our role. We all need to find a role, and we can be very fired up about it. And what also tells me right here is we don't hear that Aquila is this great preacher or speaker, but he converts somebody that literally converts thousands to Christianity in Apollos. You know, we cannot be intimidated when someone at work or at school in our neighborhood, quote, has more talent than us. We've got something they need. We have Jesus Christ. Amen. And though they have more talents, we have something they need. And we've got to preach the word because if they become a disciple, they may reach thousands. Is that a great challenge for us to be like Priscilla and Aquila? Well, of course, the the interesting thing is we find that Paul reunites with them back in Ephesus. And we find this to be true by looking at 1 Corinthians 16. Let's go there quickly. In 1 Corinthians 16, we find this record. The churches in the province of Asia send you greetings. Now, Asia is the western part of what we call modern-day Turkey. In the book of Revelation, there are the seven churches of Asia. What's the first church mentioned? Ephesus. Ephesus was the pillar church. The word went into Ephesus with Paul, and then it spread out through all the province of Asia to the other six churches of Asia. You see that, guys? So the church of the province of Asia send you greetings. Aquila and Priscilla greet you warmly in the Lord, and so does the church that meets in their house. All the brothers here send you greetings. Greet one another with a holy kiss. I mean, wherever Priscilla and Aquila went, they had a house church. They had a powerful ministry for the Lord. They may not have been as eloquent or as powerful as Paul or Apollos, but they were leaders enough to lead a small group of people in their home. I really believe that's something that almost all of us can aspire to, is to have a house church, is to have a Bible talk, meet in our homes where we teach people about Jesus Christ. Let's get back to the book of Romans because we see right here something very interesting. The Bible says that Priscilla and Aquila in verse 4 risk their lives for me. And not only I, but all the churches of the Gentile are grateful. He says, I salute them. Why? Because they risked their lives. You know, today, matter of fact, the whole weekend, we are celebrating Memorial Day. And this celebrates when our soldiers through the years have literally gone to battle so that we can enjoy the freedom of democracy and the freedom of religion. Amen. Amen. I mean, uh, I'm inspired. We've got uh, one of our soldiers here today, Andrew Todd, sitting right there in his uniform right there. And he's going to be heading off to Iraq in a couple of weeks. So we need to be praying for this brother. Amen, church. But we honor men like that. Whether we agree with the war or not, we honor men who are willing to lay down their lives so that we might enjoy freedom. Amen, church. And yet as disciples, we are called to an either higher 
commitment and a higher standard. Aquila and Priscilla risked their lives for the sake of the gospel. Now, you, you hear people saying, well, yeah, the campus students, they can be fired up. They can be committed 24-7. But, you know, I'm married. Oh. Let me tell you something. Aquila and Priscilla were married, and what an awesome marriage they had. They risked their lives together. You know, in the atmosphere in our churches, we got people thinking, well, should I come to Wednesday night? Gee, I'm really tired from work. I, I, I'm telling you guys. There has been a false doctrine of cheap grace that spread in the churches that says, hey, you can show up to church anytime you want. Commitment's not really necessary. Let me tell you something. The commitment of the first century was that you laid down your life for the Lord. You laid down your life for your brothers and sisters. You were willing to risk your life for the cause. Amen. I remember back many years ago, we sent a small team of disciples into Cairo, Egypt. It's the first church that we sent into the Middle East. They were there for eight months. There were seven Americans and one Egyptian. After eight months, the seven Americans got kicked out. And I was there last night. We had four baptisms the last night that they were there. And yet the Christians were really shaky. We had 23 baptisms at that point, which is really pretty awesome in Cairo. Amen. And the one brother that was Egyptian, he goes, I know this is going to happen to me. I was going to be stuck and nobody was going to come to me. And I said, listen, Mo, Mo Bashar, uh, I said, bro, I tell you what, I will bring Elena and I'll bring the kids and we'll come back this summer and we will study the church. And we came and we lived in Cairo for a month, taught the first principles. Yeah, we had death threats, not towards us only, but also toward the kids. But you know what it did to the disciples there? They just got intense and tough to listen. Our brothers and sisters in America are not going to desert us. It doesn't matter what persecutions come. There are brothers and sisters that likewise, like us, are willing to risk their lives for the gospel. Now, let me tell you something. You get that kind of commitment, it is going to be an incredible encouragement to your kids. Are you with me right here, guys? You know, one of the couples that I so love is uh, Sean and Cheryl de Montempre. Amen. And, you know, Sean's the brother, you know, that had, had fallen away. His wife had fallen away. And he was the one in coming to Portland where he had the U-Haul that the brakes went out. You remember that little story and everything? And the, the, the Lord was trying to encourage him to get serious with his life. Amen. <laughs> and it really was awesome. At the marriage retreat just last month, both Sean and Cheryl were restored to the Lord. And, uh, you know, what was awesome, though, is that when they first came, their son, Jordan, uh, he was doubting God, doubting Jesus, doubting the Bible, had attitudes towards the parents. I mean, of course, that's pretty typical. Thirteen. Amen. You know, <laughs> and he didn't want to come to church. He didn't see it in their lives. And the church there wasn't fired up. And he didn't want any part. You know something? When his parents came up here and started to fight for their salvation. When they wrestled with the sins in their marriage. And then when they came before the church, said, listen, we want to be sold out disciples. We want to do anything, give up everything and go anywhere. That's when Jordan starts studying. And today, Jordan is getting baptized. Amen, church? Does that fire you on up? You want to affect your family? Then you be totally committed to Jesus Christ. You want your children to be fired up about the Lord? Then you be fired up about the Lord. That's the kind of heart that Aquila and Priscilla had. Let's move on. You know, it's very interesting. In this chapter, Paul names 35 people. And when I first started reading it over last week, I go, oops, I better start Working on pronouncing all those names right there, you know. So I wrote all the names. And actually, there are 37 because two of the people are not named by name. One is Rufus's mom and the other is Nereus' sister. So there are 37 people that are named right here. And he salutes these people. Now, what that tells me is Paul loved the Lord with all of his heart, risked his life for the cause of the gospel... But he invested his life into people. 
Look at all the relationships he has. And when you go to the scriptures, it's not uncommon to find salute Mary, who worked very hard for you. The references are about the work of the Lord. That's what bonds us in Christ. You know, it is interesting. The number of people that are in Rome that Paul salutes here. And it's also interesting that just a a few years before, everybody had been kicked out of Rome. One guy suggests, and I think it's true, that the brothers got together and said, hey, we've got to send the disciples back into Rome. Is that pretty incredible? That's why so many of Paul's former workers were there. Is they were sent back in to reestablish and strengthen the church at Rome. Because so many of the disciples had been kicked out. You know, we have to have a commitment to be willing to go anywhere and do anything. You know, here in this congregation, I I was just so inspired. Right before Xavier uh, graduated from law school, he came over to my house the Friday before. And I I, I said, Xavier, what's on your heart? He says, listen, bro. I'm excited about my law degree, but I know it's only part of God's purpose. Bro, I would like to be on the Bend mission team. And I said, amen, bro. You're on it. Amen. (laughs) I mean, he has a heart. Listen, I know that God has given me certain gifts. He's put me in certain situations for a purpose. And now he's going to use his gifts and his training to help plant churches. We've got to understand this world is not our home. We are here in Portland for a purpose. You say, well, how long are we all going to be here? As long as the Holy Spirit keeps us here. And then when he says move, we got to go. Amen. Amen. And we got to be willing to preach the word wherever the Holy Spirit sends us. Amen. Amen. The second thing that I noticed about all these people is the number of women that Paul mentions right here. I mean, there's Phoebe, there's Priscilla, there's Mary, there's Tryphena and Tryphosa. Now, of course, they maybe had a little attitude towards their mom for those names. I don't, I don't know. You know what I'm talking about? There's the mother of Rufus, Julia, and Nereus' sister. I mean, guys, you've got to understand, this was the first century when women were put down. The Jewish man, thank God every day, he was not a woman. You know something? Jesus and Paul were revolutionaries. When it came to the role of women, you know, it's so sad that the world sees churches now as holding women back. And I think there are reasons for that. I don't think it's just a random thought the world has. I think in a lot of churches that call themselves conservative, they just want the women to cook and shut up. Now, there's nothing wrong with the cooking parts. Because if some of us guys cooked, we'd be in trouble. Know what I'm talking about right there? But that wasn't the relationship that Paul called upon these people. With Phoebe, he says, Phoebe, you got to take this letter to the brothers and sisters in Rome. With Priscilla, he says, man, I remember when we risked our lives together. With Mary, who worked very hard. Trophina and Trifosa, who worked so hard in the Lord. I mean, it's, it's amazing. He had incredible relationships with women as a man. Now, they were in absolute purity, amen? Amen. But it was because of the mission. And isn't it great to be in a fellowship where we really do have sisters and brothers in Christ that we can honor and be great friends with? Isn't it? Isn't it awesome, church? Does that fire you on up? You know, I really believe, though, we've we've got to take this chapter and apply it to our church today. I don't think that God intends for the women just to sit at home, cook, and then just shut up. I think that is absolutely sinful, and it turns a lot of high-powered young ladies off for God. I think it's why a lot of young ladies don't want anything to do with the church. They want to be in something that makes a difference in people's lives. They want to do something with their lives. Let me tell you something. In this church, we need to have a high-powered women's ministry. Are you with me, church? You know, I'm, I am so thankful. I am thankful. We've got women like Elena and Carlene and Sonia and Marcia, Therese, Denise, Mika, Michelle, that are standing up for the Lord. That some have jobs. Some are homemakers and moms. But they are all preaching the word for Jesus Christ. 
Let me tell you something. When young women see that, they go, wow, that's what I want to be. A woman on a mission from God. And we need to honor the women in our church. I'm particularly fired up about Lauren Rasmussen coming from New Mexico. You know, so many young people were let go as interns in our churches around the world because of lack of money and a lack of confidence in the church. Lauren always dreamed about being in the full-time ministry. She says, well, I'll switch out of that. I'll, I'll go be a doctor. Now, it's great to be a doctor. Amen. We could use some Christian doctors. Amen. I would trust them a lot more when they slice and dice, you see. <laughs> But she wanted to be full-time, but she thought the hope was gone. We sat down with her just about a week ago, and we said, Lauren, listen, we want you to come to Portland just for a couple of months and to see if it's the will of God for you to go into full-time ministry. She says, I I didn't think that was possible. I I I wanted to become a doctor because I thought maybe I could work for Hope or something then. I I want to do something for the church. I want to do something for God. I I didn't think it would be possible to even think about working for the Lord full-time. You know, I really hope and pray that those with the leadership gifts, and the Bible talks about us having different gifts, that those with the leadership gifts that are women will seriously consider going into the women's ministry and helping out other women. We need to have a conviction that this church is going to sacrifice financially whatever it takes to launch out young evangelists and young women's ministry leaders from this place to preach the word around the world. Are you with me, church? You know, it also strikes me as interesting in these series of relationships, the number of relatives that Paul has. There's Andronicus and Junius. They were in prison with him. Now, that's a good relative. Amen. Herodian. And then later on in verse 21, it says, Lucius, Jason, and Sosipater. They were, they were with Paul when he was writing to the Roman church. But he says, these are my relatives as well. You know, Paul had so many relatives that were disciples. You know, I think as a church, we have got to get a lot deeper convictions that we need to convert our families. Are you with me right here, guys? What's it going to take to convert our families? Number one, it takes a godly life. Your families know you better than anybody else. And they know if you've really changed. Let me tell you something. If you have radically changed, your family is going to be the first to know. But if you don't radically change, what's the appeal of the gospel? Secondly, you can't just say, I'm just going to let my light shine and they're going to see, see a difference. No, you're going to have to speak up. You're going to have to love them more than the relationship. You mean it might put some problems or frictions in the relationship? Exactly. What price are you willing to pay? For your family's salvation. You've got to have deep conviction. You want your mom and your dad and your your brother and your sister and your whole expanded clan in the kingdom of God. Are you with me right here, church? You know, it's a very interesting thing. When it comes to family, we get sentimental about who is saved and who is lost. And let me tell you something. The Bible is true for everybody. Just because your mom reads the, the Bible a little bit every three days doesn't mean that she's an awesome disciple. It means you have to have a conviction. What does it take to be right with God? They have to respond to the cross of Jesus Christ and respond with the commitment of a disciple and then be baptized. If they have not done that, they are not saved. You need to have that conviction because it's God's word. Are you with me right here? And you got to talk about it. Yes, it may be uncomfortable, but my goodness gracious, look at all the family members that Paul was able to convert. And look at how fired up he was when they joined him in prison. Amen. We, you know, if the gospel sends us to prison, we want some people to come there too. Amen. You know, I think the other thing that's interesting is not only the physical family, but the spiritual family that Paul had. Notice, if you will, in verse 13, he says, salute Rufus, chosen in the Lord. Does that sound special to you guys? And his mother, who's been a mother to me too. Now, I want us to look at a passage that I believe connects for us who Rufus really is. Because this must have been a special person. Out of all the people listed in in chapter 16, it's a very special salute. Rufus, chosen in the Lord. Go to Mark chapter 15. Mark 15. 
In Mark chapter 15, remember Jesus is on his way to the cross. He's, he's been beaten. He's been flogged. He's lost incredible amounts of blood. His body is going into shock. He's carrying the cross, but he can't carry it anymore, and he falls down. And then we read this passage, verse 21. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. Whoa. I believe the Rufus of Romans 16 is the Rufus of Mark 15. I mean, think about it. I mean, God is not going to ask some doofus to carry Jesus' cross. He gets this guy, Simon, from North Africa. And the Bible just then carefully notes, oh, yes, he had two sons, Alexander and Rufus. Now, very interestingly, Romans is written in about 58 A.D., so it becomes the first time that Rufus's name is raised. So the profile comes here. The book of Mark is not written till the mid-60s. So some people think, well, it would be two different guys. I don't think so. The time period is the same, that the names are being raised. And secondly, Romans is the first to raise his name. And you've got to admit, I mean, if your dad carried the cross of Jesus, you're chosen in the Lord. You know what I'm talking about right here? And notice it doesn't say anything about Simon. I, I think perhaps by this time, Simon may have died. And so... It may, in fact, be all the more reason why Paul took a special interest in Rufus's mom, the wife of Simon. And it became his mom in the faith. You know, the great blessing of the church is that God says we are blessed, yes, with persecution, sometimes even from our family. But we have a hundred times in this life moms and brothers and sisters. Amen. Amen. And I really hope that you have those kind of relationships in the church, like Paul, that this is your spiritual family. You know, I notice when people really do lousy spiritually, they have a tendency to gravitate back to the physical family because there is a security in family, is there not? It's because they lose their trust in the spiritual family. I've just got to ask you, where is your trust in God's spiritual family? I pray that you work hard to have mothers in the faith and fathers in the faith and brothers and, and sisters and cousins and whatever we need in the faith. Amen. Are you with me right here, church? You know, another thing that's very interesting right here is the grouping of disciples in verses 14 and 15. Let's read it together. Salute Asyncritus, Phlegon, Hermes, Petrobus, Hermias, and the brothers with them. Greet Philologus. Julia, Nereus and his sister, and Olympus and all the saints with them. Right here, it seems to me that there also were small groups. It was the house church of Priscilla and Aquila, and you get the small groupings of these disciples. There's no doubt that the New Testament church just didn't meet in one great massive group. They were broken into small groups that could meet each other's needs. Are you with me right here, church? Now look at verse 16. Verse 16 is a fun one. It says, greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ send greetings. Now, it's kind of interesting. You know, when I do these studies, I look at different commentaries. And one of my commentaries is a very, very, quote, arch conservative commentary. And I looked at it, it says, emphatically, when Paul was telling people that the holy kiss, they say, first of all, the holy kiss wasn't necessary. And I'm going, hold it. Holy kiss wasn't necessary. It's also mentioned in 1 Corinthians 16. That bothers me when someone says something's not necessary, but it's in the scriptures. Have you ever been there? Because they aren't doing it, they go, it's not necessary. That scares me a little bit. Secondly, he said, well, it was only the holy kiss was only between men to men and women to women. I went to another one. It says it was a mixed thing. And then I thought, well, you know, it's interesting. Commentaries are thoughtful, but they are of human origin. Footnotes in your Bible, though thoughtful, are of human origin. And I looked at this and I go, well, what does the Bible say? It says, greet one another. And one another means men and women, if I'm not mistaken. 
Also, when Paul talked about the interaction between men and women, he always would put in a line like in 1 Timothy chapter 5. He says, and, and treat the sisters with absolute purity. Therefore, I find it very interesting that a similar terminology is used. And greet one another with a holy kiss. No erotic element there. But a holy, you know, it, it, it seems to me that there was to be purity because it was a sign of greeting. Now, here at the church, we give holy hugs. Amen. Amen. But you know, I think it'd be fun today. We just put the scriptures into practice. I want you to turn. I want you to turn to your right and your left and give a holy kiss right on the cheek. Okay, enough holy kissing right there. Amen. I mean, Jeff's going to cross the aisle right here. I mean, amen. You know what's awesome is our brothers and sisters, our brothers and sisters in like Mexico City, they give holy kisses. Our brothers and sisters over in Paris, they give holy kisses. I mean, the church is to be affectionate. Are you with me here, church? That way when non-Christians walk in, they go, wow, you guys really like each other. That's amazing. At my church, we kind of sit all spaced out and, you know, we give a little handshake and, and then it's off to Burger King afterwards. Amen. <laughs> Guys, we got to be a church that's family. Are you with me right here, church? And Paul wanted to make sure that we were affectionate with purity with one another because it was a sign of love to a lost world. Point number two, the denunciation of division. In the Bible, there are two kinds of division. Ungodly and godly. The ungodly division is mentioned here. Verse 17. I urge you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause division and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. Keep away from them. For such people are not serving our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of naive people. Everyone's heard about your obedience, so I'm full of joy over you. But I want you to be wise about what's good and innocent about what is evil. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. Remember in the passion when he stepped on the head of that snake? I mean, that is fulfillment of the scriptures in Genesis chapter 3. That Satan's head would be crushed. Notice that's connected with the issue of divisiveness in brothers and sisters there in Rome. What was the divisiveness over? Well, it was people who started teaching things contrary to what they had learned when they'd first become disciples. And the Bible says right here, these people are not serving Lord Jesus, but their own appetites. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of naive people. Now, let's begin to lay it out here, church. There's a lot of garbage on the Internet written negative about us. And if you got your head in that garbage, guess what your head and your heart are filled with? You know, the, the, the Internet people have a little saying. Garbage in, garbage out. See, you bring in the garbage into your mind and heart, that's what you're going to talk about. The Bible says just stay away from it. Just stay away from it. It hurts your faith. It hurts your convictions. It hurts your commitment. Are you with me here, church? Now, that's ungodly division. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. There is godly division. What? Godly division? Yeah. Paul talks about it. We've got to talk about it. You know, it's interesting to me that as we move into different stages of our fellowship, Different scriptures come to light. Are you with me right here, guys? And they speak to us so clearly. This scripture, 1 Corinthians 11, we've used a lot of times for communion, and rightfully so. But look what it says in verse 17. Paul says, and he's talking to church at Corinth. In the following directives, I have no praise for you. For your meetings do more harm than good. Wow, that's not really encouraging, is it? In the first place... I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. And 
To some extent, I believe it. No doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. Now, we need to look at this scripture very carefully. In the light of where we're at in our fellowship of churches, the issue of autonomy where each of these churches is independent has caused a lot of division amongst us. And we need to recognize some very basic things. Number one, as a church of disciples, no one is going to stop us from fellowshipping another church of disciples. There are brothers and sisters that have served long and hard that are under a great deal of criticism now. People like a Steve Johnson or a Doug Arthur or a Bob and Pat Gimple. Let, let me tell you something. They're going to be welcomed in this church. I mean, you know what I'm talking about right here? Yeah, they may be controversial. But let me tell you something. They're my brother, and I'm going to stand up for them. And we've got brothers that are speaking on our program that, you know, aren't loved in other parts of our fellowship. Let me tell you something. We need to flat love up on them when they come to Jubilee. Are you with me here, church? I think we've also need to understand that as, as a church, we, we have taken some bold initiatives. We have said, listen, foremost in this congregation, we are going to be in submission to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. We are not going to stand for cheap grace. We expect every single member to be totally committed. We expect every single member to be a disciple. We expect every single member to be in discipling relationships and to preach the word. We do not apologize at all for our stand of commitment and our call for every single member to be sold out for Jesus Christ. Now, in this day and age, that's controversial. There are people who say, hold it, you guys are too radical, too zealous. Let me tell you something. Was Jesus too radical? Was Jesus too controversial? My Bible tells me if you're not controversial, you're not like Jesus. You know, sad to say, there are some people that say, well, okay, you guys in Portland are doing a pretty good job, and we've invited them to come speak at our conference, and they refuse to come. Say, so, well, we're not against you. We're just not for you. We, we, we want to have friends everywhere. Wow. You know, one of my heroes is John F. Kennedy. It was his birthday, May 29th. On, now, I always think about him. He's got his birthday a couple days before mine, so amen. <laughs> and his favorite quote was from Dante's Inferno. He said, this is John F. Candy, the hottest places in hell are reserved for those who during the time of moral crisis preserve their neutrality. Let me tell you something. This pulpit will not be neutral on Jesus Christ. This pulpit will not be neutral on the word of God. This pulpit will not be neutral on fellowship. We are going to be a hard line, sold out congregation for Jesus Christ. At the end of Romans chapter 16, Paul closes in verse 25. And he says... Now to him who is able to establish you by my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God, so that all nations might believe and obey him. To the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ. And the church said, Amen. Isn't it interesting that here at the end of the epistle, that all agree is unique. That is indeed written to be a treatise of the Christian faith itself. That Paul summarizes everything and says, we need to obey all the commands that have been revealed to us. So that all nations might believe and obey Jesus Christ. See, our last point is the evangelization of all nations. 
Yeah, we need the salutations of appreciation. We, we need to salute those that are awesome in the Lord. Amen, church? We need to denounce ungodly division. But we will and say, hold it. Hey, sometimes there have got to be divisions to show which ones have God's approval. But right here, he ends with the evangelization of the world. You know, it's very interesting. I was talking to a brother this past week. And he says, bro, you know, I really appreciate your faith and your dream to evangelize the world in our generation. And I think it's very noble. But it's too bad it's not in the scriptures. Now, we need to get it straight in our congregation here, guys. Over the past two years, there have been certain teachers that have propagated throughout our fellowship that the evangelization of the world in our generation is not a command of God. And I want us to get some convictions from the word of God today about what the command of God is. Turn to Matthew chapter 28. In Matthew chapter 28, we find that Jesus has died and resurrected. And we pick it up in verse 16. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Right here, the explicit command is Jesus speaking to the 11 faithful apostles. Amen, church? And his command is saying, very simply, go make disciples of all nations. Baptize them. In the Greek, the word them refers back to nations. Now, that is the command of Jesus to the eleven. Now, it explicitly comes down to all of us. You see, you mean the Great Commission's for us too? Oh, yeah. The Great Commission's for us because after you become a disciple and you're baptized, then what, is, what, what are people supposed to do? It says, and teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. What was the last thing Jesus commanded them? To go and make disciples. So every generation of disciples that's baptized is then to be taught to go and make disciples and baptize them and then to teach them everything the Lord has commanded them. You see how the command is for everybody there, church? But I think the important thing to see right here is the evangelization of the world is intended to be done. In the lifetime of a generation. That was the expectation of Jesus Christ. And I pray that as a disciple, you will buy into that. That you will have a conviction. That is the call of Jesus for our lives. Amen? You know, it's kind of interesting. Tomorrow, I turn 50 years old. Amen. And, uh... You know, I, I, I had to get into kind of a special Bible study this week. I, I, I felt like I had to get into the scriptures and figure out when middle age started. So I said, well, you know, I, I probably need to check out, I don't know why I picked him, Moses. And I went and studied and I studied all his life on out and I found out that he died at 120. And so I figured middle age, divide in half, is 60. So I go, okay, I got 10 more years for I'm middle age. So I'm very fired up about that. And I thought I'd share that with everybody on out there. So still being a young man, just 10 years away from middle age, I've noticed that people my age have a tendency to be grumpy, to be critical, to be disillusioned and to be bitter. And the Bible says in Hebrews 12, verse 15, that bitterness can cause you to miss the grace of God. See, what happens when you get to be 50 is you've had a lot of chances to have relationships. And 
all of your relationships, some are with Christians, some are with non-Christians, but all of your relationships are with sinners. And, you know, when you get into a relationship with another sinner, do you know what you guys do a lot? And when we sin, we hurt each other, don't we? Let me tell you something. You have 50 years of relationships. You've, you've got a lot of hits on you. And I put a lot of hits on other people, too. But, you know, we always remember the ones that hit us. Know what I'm talking about right here, guys? So the longer you live, the more relationships you have, the more chances you have for hurts in relationships. Also, the older you get, you start figuring out, you know something? I don't think I'm going to be president of Nike. Or I don't think I'm going to make my first million by 30, seeing as how I'm 47. I may not make my first million. (laughs) And what happens is disillusionment sets in because some of our dreams of youth aren't going to be realized. And so what happens is people mature in Christ, they begin to settle for what they got. And that settles on into complacency and lukewarmness. And as disciples in this church, we've talked over and over again. Bitterness is understandable, but absolutely unacceptable. And I know in my own life, I mean, it's, it's been a challenge over the last couple of years not to get bitter. But you know, as I've had people in my life call me not to be bitter, as I've gotten in scriptures and tried to pray to God just to focus on the future, I mean, it, it's been amazing. There's always the temptation as we all look back. You know what I'm talking about right That. But, you know, honestly, here I am, 50 tomorrow. I'm flat fired up about it. I mean, you know, a lot of people worry about 40 or 50, and they worry about giving black balloons or something like that. I'm I'm not the least bit worried about it because I know God has a purpose for my life. You know, one of the uh, my, my favorite musicals is by Cervantes, The Man of La Mancha. It's about Don Quixote. And uh, Don Quixote was this, this dreamer guy that used to go off, and he was a little crazy, some people thought. But he used to go off and fight windmills. And he was this dreamer. And the story centers a little bit around this prostitute that he meets. And her name is Eldanza. And she is a true prostitute. That sold her body and her mind and her soul. And she's got nothing. And here's this old man, this, this dreamer. Comes up to her and he, and he goes, what is your name? She goes, Eldonza. He goes, no, 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 no. Your, your name is not Eldonza. Your name is Dulcinea. In his mind, she was a beautiful woman with a beautiful name. And throughout his interactions with her, she would fight it. I'm I'm not Dulcinea. I'm Eldanza the whore. But he said, no, no, no. You are Dulcinea. Well, it goes on, and near the end, someone has the audacity to put a mirror up in front of Don Quixote, this this dreamer. And he looks at the mirror, and he sees reality. He sees what he's really like. An old man with few hairs and many wrinkles. And it causes him to lose his dreams. He becomes disillusioned because he sees himself as he really is. But then at the end, Dulcinea comes to him. And she says, do you remember the dream? He goes, no, 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 get away from me. He says, no, 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 you changed me. He says, who are you? She goes, I am Dulcinea. And 
as she speaks, as a person whose life was changed because of this man not seeing life as it is, but seeing life as it should be. He gets up. And he sings the words of the impossible dream. To dream the impossible dream. To fight the unbeatable foe. To bear with unbearable sorrow. To run where the brave dare not go. To right the unrightable wrong. To love pure and chaste from afar. To try when your arms are too weary to reach the unreachable stars. This is my quest to follow that star. No matter how hopeless, no matter how far. To fight for the right without question or pause. To be willing to march into hell for a heavenly cause. And I know if I'll only be true to this glorious quest. That my heart will lie peaceful and calm when I'm laid to my rest. And the world will be better for this. That one man scorned and covered with scars still strove with that last ounce of courage to reach the unreachable star. There will be people that will tell you the evangelization of the world is an impossible dream. I am here to tell you through the scriptures of the Holy Spirit that God not only dreams it, he demands it. He demands it in this generation. He expects us to be sold out to him and therefore to his mission. And so for me, 50, I've still got the dream. I'm, I'm not even the middle age yet. And I hope no matter what you hear Satan say, God has a dream for your life. As Paul spoke about David, he said, the time and the purpose of David's life ended when he died. Acts 13, 36. That tells me, as long as we're still living, as long as we're still breathing, God has a purpose for our life, a great individual purpose that collectively dovetails into his dream to evangelize the world in this generation. Thank you, and God bless. 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 Thank you, and God bless.